Hello, everyone, and welcome to the ELDT, General Knowledge Theory. Uh, my name is Josh Barron, and I will be your certified instructor here today. Um, now, this ELDT theory portion is uh, what everyone needs to take nowadays uh, in order to become ELDT certified and uh, receive your Class A, Class B, or Class C CDL or even being able to get your school bus or passenger endorsement, you have to go through the uh, what they call the entry-level driver training. So this is the, the ELDT theory. Uh, now, there's a lot of information on here. And um, I first off want to want to welcome you to, uh, to the truck driving school. And if you are a current student, uh, welcome back. If you're a new student, well, welcome to the school. We're happy to have you. And uh, just know that my phone lines and email is open. So if you have questions on this stuff, feel free to drop me an email, eldtonline at midwesttruckdrivingschool.com. And I'm going to go and put that uh, in the notes uh, down below as well. And um, uh, uh, Or like I said, drop me a ring. That's fine as well. And uh, once again, I'll put that number down there too. Um, so let's go ahead and dive right in. And I do encourage you guys, feel free to go through this material a couple of times as there is a lot of material on here. So if you'd like to take notes, go ahead and take notes on this material. If you have questions, write those down. And uh, and if it takes you a couple times to go through this, feel free to do that as, like I said, there's a lot of material covered throughout this presentation. So let's go ahead and dive right in. Obtaining a commercial learner's permit. Um, so that's the first step. In, in kind of getting a class A, class B, class C CDL. And uh, before you do that, you got to be able to pass a DOT physical and receive a DOT medical card. And that's typically done beforehand. You go to uh, the majority of doctors do DOT physicals, but uh, go to your doctor and ask them, do you do DOT physicals? And once again, uh, typically after you pass that, they're going to give you a two-year medical card. Uh, then you have to complete the required ELDT training which you guys are doing now. Uh, then you have to take the written knowledge test at your state's DMV. So, uh, you know, right here in Michigan, they call it Secretary of State. Uh, in Wisconsin, they call it the DMV. A lot of other states, they call it the DMV. But there's a lot of other acronyms that they use out there like BMV or MVD or SOS or DDS or HSMV or MVA or DOT or any of those other ones. So just know that we're talking about the Department of Motor Vehicles, where you go to uh, get your license transferred or take those, uh, like I said, those CLP knowledge tests. Now, there are some state instituted restrictions as well. And what I mean by that is a lot of DMVs out there limit to taking this knowledge test five times in a year. So this is not a test you want to go down there and just wing and just kind of go for it. Um, no, you want to study, you want to practice, go through this material a couple of times. If you go through this material uh, a couple of times, um, I'll tell you what, we've done this this training for over 10,000 students and they've all got their CLPs. They've all passed the general knowledge tests down at the DMV. So go through this uh, a couple of times, especially if you're in one of those states that limit the, the to taking that knowledge test five times in a year. Um, also, in some states, there's a mandatory week waiting period in between tests. So uh, if you don't want to wait, wait another week to have to go back down and retake a test, well, go through this material, study it, and that way you'll be able to pass this stuff uh, the first time around. Uh, next bullet point there, we'll need to take the air brake training and test if driving a CMV with air brakes, and we'll need to take the combination vehicle training and test uh, for uh, specifically Class A CDLs. So once again, the school has a great training in regards to air brakes and a great training in regards to combination vehicles as well. So if um, if you're driving a vehicle, a CMV with air brakes, then take uh, take the school's uh, air brake training. Uh, goes into in-depth uh, about air brakes and air brake systems and why do semi trucks have air brakes, uh, all that good information. And then uh, combination vehicle, a great training as well if you plan on getting your class A CDL. And then from there, you got to take behind the wheel and range training with a certified provider listed on the TPR. So those are the, the steps to, to getting a commercial driver's license. 
Um, all right, so let's go and dive right in here. General knowledge, communicating in safe driving means signaling your intentions and letting other drivers know you're there to help prevent crashes. Now think for a second, how have you seen semi-truck drivers signal out on the road? And uh, a couple come to mind, uh, stuff that I, I did a lot is uh, one of them's using your flashers. Uh, if you're going up a big hill and uh, that hill is slowing you down, well, if you're going less than 40, 45 miles an hour, turn on your flashers because at that point you're a hazard in the road. Uh, even if you're merging onto a highway and uh, there's a lot of traffic, well, turn on your flashers, letting the traffic know, hey, I'm a hazard in the road at this moment and I uh, it's going to take me a minute to be able to get up to speed. Uh, so that's important. And then, of course, you have you know using your CB radio. All right, that's that's a great way to communicate while on the road. Um, a lot of different things you can do there. Uh, at night, when a vehicle is carrying a load that extends four feet or more beyond the rear of the vehicle, there must be two red lights at the extreme end of the load. Um, so if you get into oversized loads, driving at night, driving during the day, um, uh, for, for, for this one, at nighttime, you got to have two red lights at the extreme end of the load. But if that same load is traveling during the day, there needs to be two red flags placed at the extreme end of the load. Uh, and then you must wear a seatbelt whenever you're driving a CMV, just like your personal vehicle. You have to have a seatbelt on uh, in a CMV and a semi truck. You got to have a seatbelt on as well. Empty trucks do not have the best braking. Fully loaded ones do. Now, this is surprising to a lot of people, but the fact of the matter is, is semi trucks and trailers are designed to have weight. And air brake systems work better when there is weight in that vehicle. So, a good example I can give is uh, kind of a scenario that we've all seen is uh, you see a semi truck and trailer come to a stop, a quick stop, and you see that rear axle skipping. Chick -chick 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 skipping on the road and uh well guess what that happens when that trailer's empty and every time those wheels skip it actually increases that truck stopping distance so if that truck was fully loaded um you, it would it would be squatting down to the ground and it would come to a stop quicker once again semi truck and trailers um cmvs in general are designed to have weight and the suspension components the tires the brakes they work better when they have weight so once again fully loaded ones have the best braking uh, bobtail tractors have the longest stopping distance so bobtail tractors are literally just the semi truck. This is what they call just the semi truck they call bobtailing or bobtail tractors. Now they have the longest stopping distance because you have no weight back there. You don't have a trailer on uh, and you don't have any weight in the trailer. You're just bobtailing and therefore you're not going to have nearly as much traction and it's going to take that bobtail tractor longer to stop because of that. And then here we have federal and state inspectors may inspect your truck or bus and have the authority to place you out of service. Uh, the first thing an inspector will look at is you. Um, so if you've ever gotten pulled over, that's true. They're going to look at you. Um, are you fatigued? Are you under the influence of something? Uh, do you have bags under your eyes? They're going to be looking at a lot of things. But once again, the first thing they're going to be looking at is you. And then rough acceleration could cause mechanical damage and damage to the coupling. Uh, now, this is important in reference to a CMV. Now, your personal vehicle, you can stomp on the on the fuel pedal, the gas pedal, and it's probably not going to do uh, a whole lot of damage. Now, you do that in a CMV, especially when you're fully loaded, um, you can you can easily snap a U-joint or, or bust a drive shaft or something along those lines. So we want to be smooth. We never want to pop that clutch. Um, we want to really pay attention to those things. And then CMVs tend to be wider than passenger vehicles at about eight and a half feet, requiring extra care to keep the vehicle centered in the lane. So CMVs are taller, they're wider, they're longer. You definitely have to be more cognizant and more defensive uh, when driving any CMV. Uh, adverse weather conditions, black ice. Black ice is actually a thin layer of clear ice that you can see the road underneath of it. So, it, of course, it appears black. Uh, in the wintertime, asphalt tends to look grayish white because of road salt. So if you drive in the northern climates or or in the in the Rockies or anything like that, you're gonna you're gonna see this. This is very very common. You're gonna see black ice, and um, especially in the Midwest, we use a lot of salt on our roads around here. So in the wintertime, it looks the the roads look grayish white because of that road salt. 
Uh, if the road you're driving on becomes very slippery because of glare ice, you should stop driving as soon as you can safely do so. So glare ice is, of course, dangerous. Glare ice is something that we don't want to drive on. And so if you find yourself in that situation, well, get off the road as, as soon as you can safely do so and uh, wait for that to pass. And then when driving in cold weather conditions, your tires should provide enough traction to steer and push the vehicle through the snow. Uh, that's important as well. When you get in the uh, western states or even here in the Midwest, um, a lot of people put on winter tires. Um, really important. Uh, we get a lot of snow in the in the northern states here. So we want to be able to be prepared for, for that snow, the icy conditions, different things. And then out west, you also see a lot of a lot of people putting on tire chains and different things. That's uh, that's normal as well. Um, but that's going to be a state-by-state state regulation that is going to change depending on what state you're in as far as those requirements go. On slippery roads, it takes longer to stop, it's harder to turn without skidding, and you should not use your engine retarder, your jake brake, um, on wet, icy, or snow-covered roads. Now, the reason for that, and we'll talk about, we'll get in-depth later on on what the jake brake actually is, but uh, the jake brake, the engine retarder, actually just slows down the engine. It uses the compression of the engine to slow down the truck. Well, what, what is that technically slowing down? It's slowing down the transmission, which is slowing down your differentials um, on your drive tires. And so if, you, if you're on icy conditions and you use your engine retarder, your jake brake, um, it can cause those drive wheels to skid. So though that's one instance that we don't want to use that jake brake um, is on I icy, wet, or snow-covered roads. And the roads are most slippery when it first starts to rain and lessens as rain continues, especially the first rain after a dry spell. The main reason for that is because you naturally have oils and different things that fall onto the road. And when it first starts to rain, rain is heavier than oil. So rain kind of goes down underneath the oil and then raises that oil up. So now we have a oily, watery, slippery surface. So it's the most slippery when it first starts to rain. And then as it continues to rain, it washes those oils off the road and the roads actually become less slippery because of that. The most common cause of serious vehicle skids and fatal crashes is driving too fast for road conditions. Um, now that's probably um, that's probably kind of common sense. People driving too fast for road conditions. You need to adjust your speed to road conditions. If you're driving in heavy fog, well, adjust your speed. You're driving at nighttime, adjust your speed. You're driving in traffic, adjust your speed. You're driving in on, on icy roads, wet roads, snow-covered roads, adjust your speed. Uh, really important information there. And then on wet roads, you want to reduce your speed by about one-third. On snow, reduce your speed about one-half. And on ice, slow down to a crawl and stop driving altogether if possible. Once again, you want to be a lot more defensive when you're driving on uh, and in adverse weather conditions. Before you drive in the winter weather, make sure the cab heater and the defroster is working properly. Um, that's important. You're driving in the winter, and if you ever had your defroster go out, um, that definitely makes for a bad day because you're literally not able to see. So, uh, And then, of course, having heat is a must in the winter time. If you must drive in fog, use the fog lights if equipped and your low beam headlights. Turn on your four-way flashers and slow down. However, don't stop along the side of the road. Uh, so that's important. Some trucks are equipped with fog lights, some trucks are not. If they're not equipped with fog lights, well, make sure you use your low beam headlights. That's going to give you the best uh, visibility when you're driving in fog. And for a thick fog, sometimes it's just best to pull off the road into a rest area or a truck stop. Plain and simple. If you got really, really thick fog, you can't see. Um, even with your flashers on, you have a hard time seeing the people in front of you. And that means the people behind you have a hard time seeing you. You want to get off the road, get into a rest stop, uh, truck stop, and slow down um, and, uh, and wait for that fog to pass. In freezing weather, slight melting will make icy surfaces become more slippery. Yeah, so if I got any ice skaters or hockey players out there, when is the ice rink, you know, the most slippery? And you're probably thinking, well, right after the Zamboni gets off of it. And you'd be exactly right because you have a, a little layer of water on top of the ice and that's going to make that coefficient of friction of the ice even lower, which is going to make it more slippery. Uh, so it's important to keep that in the back of your mind. 
Driving on snow-covered roads can increase your fuel consumption by 15 to 20 percent, and rapid acceleration can increase your fuel consumption by as much as 40 percent. So, especially right now, fuel prices are high. Uh, we want to pay attention to that stuff. All right, we want to we want to accelerate slowly, and then ideally. Hey, if, if you don't have to drive on snow-covered roads, well, you're going to save fuel uh, because of that. You should remove the ice from the radiator shutters or the winter front if it starts to build up. So a lot of trucks in the wintertime, you see these uh, on the front, what's what they call a winter front. And uh, what it does is semi-trucks have a hard time warming up in the wintertime. And so putting a winter front on there will help, help that semi-truck warm up and uh, or that school bus or that garbage truck help it warm up and keep it warm. However, if ice or snow starts to build up in these slots right here, here, or here, it can actually overheat the engine and then uh, and then potentially blow up the engine at that point. So so that would of course be be a bad thing. Um, so we want to watch that and remove the, that ice from the radiator shutters or the winter front if it starts to build up. And then when driving in cold weather, windshield washer antifreeze should be used. So what they mean there is get windshield washer fluid that is has the negative 35 or the negative 32 or the negative 20. And what it is, it's, it's the de-icer. It's the winter blend that won't freeze. Um, so that's uh, that's important. You you put the kind of the summer stuff in there in the wintertime and you go to spray that on your windshield and it freezes to your window. Oh, now we're not having a good day because um, that's going to uh, pretty much reduce reduce your visibility altogether, and that, of course, is very dangerous. Uh, before driving in the winter, your exhaust system and your tires should be checked. Um, that just makes sense. Your exhaust system um, is important because if you have some exhaust leaks underneath the cab, well, that carbon monoxide can come up into the cab and be very dangerous. And then tires, obviously, you want good tires in, uh, in the winter time to be able to steer and push that vehicle through the snow. Your low and your high beam headlights. At night when your low beam headlights are on, uh, you can see about 250 feet ahead of your vehicle. Uh, your high beams, you can see about 350 to 500 feet ahead. Um, um, that's important because you want to be able to drive uh, to be able to stop within the range of your headlights. Um, if you're not able to do that, then you kind of put yourself in a in a in a dangerous situation. Uh, if a car coming towards you at night uh, keeps its high beams on, you should look towards the right edge of your lane or the right side of the road. So technically, you shouldn't flash that car. Uh, you probably know someone that uh, that uh, was approaching a vehicle that had their high beams on, and they flashed that car, and it happened to be a police officer. And the officer turned around, pulled him over, and gave him a ticket. Uh, remember, that is illegal. You're not supposed to do that. Um, you want to look towards the right edge of your lane or the right side of the road. Uh, when driving at night, use your low beams when an oncoming vehicle is within 500 feet. So legally, that's when you need to go from high beams to low beams is when you're within about 500 feet of that approaching car. Uh, when driving at night, use the high beams as often as you can. That just makes sense. And at night, drive slow enough to be able to stop within the range of your headlights. Also, very important, um, You, uh, if you have your low beams on, then you should be slowing down a little bit uh, just because you want to be able to stop within the range of your headlights.